If you are a visitor here with us this morning, we are so glad that you have decided to join us. Uh, we would love to have a record of your visit. So in front of you, there should be a little connect card there. If you could fill that out and either hand it to me or you can put it in one of our offering boxes. Um, as we get started this morning, I just have three very quick announcements. The first announcement is that tonight at 530 is our OCC packing party. Um, we're asking you to bring a crock pot of soup or a platter of sandwiches so that we can share a meal together. And then after we eat, we will begin packing some shoe boxes with goodies. Um, and these shoe boxes will be shipped to uh, boys and girls all over the world. Um, if you're not able to help with, with packing the shoe boxes, you can make a financial donation of $10 per shoe boxes that it costs to ship these shoe boxes around the world. Um, and you can um, see um, Jerry Garrett, where is Jerry at? There he is right there. You can see Jerry Garrett for more information about that. Along with that, uh, this week is also OCC Collection Week, and we are the main collection hub for the peninsula. And Jerry needs all the volunteers he can get to help load, load these shoe boxes into those wonderful tractor trailers you see sitting out there. So if you are willing to help with that, you can see Jerry on that. And there's also a sign up list on the back wall back there. And finally, um, our, our members meeting is November the 19th. We will begin with a potluck at 5 p.m. And we will eat what you bring. So if you don't bring anything, we won't be eating together. So make sure you do bring something. And our meeting will begin at 6. Now, just a word to PBC members. Um, there are two important gatherings as, as part of uh, as, uh, as being a member at PBC. One is Sunday mornings. And secondly is our members meeting. These are important meetings because we get to welcome new members into the family. We get to vote on like this, this coming um, members meeting. We're voting on our church budget. And then it's just a sweet time that we get to hear prayer requests that you wouldn't normally hear in this kind of gathering. It's just a way for, for us to gather together and, and discuss the, the family matters of, of being a family together. So I'd encourage you to do that. Now, in this moment, if you would take a moment to prepare your hearts for worship, and then our sister Kelly will lead us in scripture reading and a prayer of praise. Today's scripture reading for the prayer of praise is Psalms 34, 19 to 22. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for bringing us here today and allowing us to be part of this church body. We are thankful <clears throat> that we have your word to teach us about your promises and to provide us assurance. These words in Psalm tell us that as God's children, we will face afflictions in this world, but in his time, you will deliver us in your time. We know that just like 2 Corinthians 1.4 says, you, Lord, comfort us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by you. We have abundant comfort through you and are so blessed that we have you as our refuge and our strength. Help us to be mindful of others around us that are struggling with an affliction and give us strength to comfort them through your love. As your servants, we are redeemed through Jesus, and we will not be condemned, although that is what we deserve as sinners. We are given the promise of eternal life through your Son, who has taken our sin through his sacrifice on the cross. Help us to never take that for granted. Help us to make time each day to praise you for your goodness, your righteousness, your attentive care, and your never-ending love for us, which neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us and love of you, God, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please join us and sing.
In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down. together to lift up your name, to call on a Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that. Yes, the
what now can separate us? Can death or pain or fear? We have this strong assurance. In Christ we've been brought near. And in his strength we'll labor. His promises are whole. Thus far his love has led us. His love. This morning, our prayer of confession is concerning the sin of cowardice. Please pray with me. Father, this morning we come to you to repent of our sin of cowardice. You gave us the command to spread the gospel and to give hope to man. You told us that this would cause us to be scorned and rejected by mankind who are still enslaved in Satan's kingdom. Father, we should expect rejection and retaliation for revealing the evil of sin to those who love it so dearly. We should be preparing our hearts and minds to spread the gospel no matter the cost, because without it, those still in the chains of sin can never break free. If we love you, then we must love your creation. We must love those that you created in your image. Despite knowing your command, Lord, we frequently choose to focus selfishly on our lives and our comfort in a cowardly way to avoid conflict. We fear the rejection of man more than disappointing the God who sacrificed everything to set us free and to give us life. God, forgive us of our cowardice, work on our hearts, burn Matthew 10, 28 into our memory where Jesus commands us, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Instill a reverential fear of you into our hearts and minds so that we realize the rejection of man is nothing in comparison to failing our king. Psalms 111.10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. God, give us a thirst for your praise and the boldness to pursue it. Forgive us the times of our cowardice and teach us to love your people so much that we discard any fear of man. Please take a moment and reflect in your hearts. In Psalms 32, 5, King David wrote, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Please stand and join us. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper in darkness trembles only a holy God what are the 
beauty demands such praises. What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy Here is love that conquers. 
was the first born from the grave. Death has failed to be found equal to the life of him who saved. In the valley of our darkness, dawned his everlasting light. Perfect love in glorious radiance has repelled death's hellish night. That same love beyond all measure mocked and slain by hateful men lives and reigns in resurrection and can never die again. Here is love for all the ages, radiant son of how he stands, calling him his father's children, holding forth his wounded Here is love, fast as the heavens, countless as the stars above, are the souls that he has ransomed, precious daughters, treasured sons. We are called to peace forever, on a love beyond our time. Father, Son, and Spirit, now with man are intertwined. You may be seated. Our sermon text this morning comes from Matthew chapter 27. We begin looking at verses 11 through 25. Matthew 27, verses 11 through 25. And scripture reads, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release from the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they, and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to him, to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting at the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Then the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what, how, what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather than a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, we come to you in prayer, and God, we're just so thankful to gather as your people this morning. 
God, we're, I'm so thankful for this congregation, so thankful for this church and the people that are, make up the church. And Father, we uh, pray this morning for PBC that we may sin, uh, see our sin more clearly. Father, we confess that we are, we are sinners. Romans 5 tells us that sin entered into the world through one man, and the result of that sin is death. And this is not just a physical death, but it is a spiritual death that causes us to be separated from you, our Heavenly Father. So, Father, your desire is that we would be sinless, but our heart's in inclination is to sin. We find our sin enticing and fulfilling. We replace your goodness, your love, your grace, your mercy with false hope and false grace and false security that we find in our sins. Father, my prayer is that we may find you more appealing, you more satisfying, and you more worthy than we may find our sin. May we desire closeness in our relationship with you. May we see your display of love in that while we were living a life of sinning, you sent your son Jesus to die for us. May we be marked as people who pursue holiness and seek to put our sin to death for your glory's sake. Give us spiritual eyes to see our sin for what it truly is, rebellion against our loving Father. Forgive us where we have sinned against you. And Father, we cling to the promise of found in Scripture that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And that's what we hold on to this morning. Father, not only do we pray for PBC, we lift up one of our kingdom partners in Temple Baptist Church and their pastor, Wes Taylor. We are thankful for this like-minded church in a local area who seeks to glorify your name in the Hamptons Road area. We pray for Wes as he leads the congregation through the Gospel of Matthew on Sunday mornings. May, may the people see your truth in Scripture and be encouraged, convicted, and edified through the faithful teaching of your word. We pray for Wes as he shepherds the sheep that you have entrusted to him at Temple Baptist. And I pray that you may strengthen his walk so that he may be found a faithful shepherd. We pray for the saints at Temple as they gather this morning. May the prayers prayed, the songs sung, and the preaching of your word honor and glorify you this morning. And may you bless this gospel partner. Now we pray for the U.S. And God, we pray for our veterans. We come with a grateful heart, recognizing the sacrifice and service that these men and women have given. We lift them up to you and ask for your continued grace and peace and healing in their lives. We're thankful that for the courage and dedication that they have shown to in serving our country. We pray that you bless them for their selflessness, for putting the needs of others before their own, and the sacrifices that they have made to protect the freedoms that we hold dear, such as gathering on a Sunday morning. We pray for those who bear physical and emotional wounds from their time in service. I pray for healing on their bodies and in their minds, grant them strength and comfort, but most of all, I pray for their souls. God, some of these men and women have seen un, un, um, su such evils and horrors, God. But, Father, you can speak into their life with the gospel, and we pray for that. Father, we remember those who have lost uh, friends and brothers and sisters in the line of duty, and we pray that you comfort them with the grief as they grieve, and may they find in your word life. We ask for guidance and provision as, our, as veterans transition back to civilian life. I pray that you open opportunities for employment, education, and meaningful community that they may find in a church a local to their area. And Lord, we pray that you grant our veterans a sense of purpose and fulfillment in their days ahead. May they find joy and peace and a renewed sense of hope, and may they find that in you alone. As a nation, help us to honor and appreciate their sacrifice, recognizing the price they paid for the freedom that we enjoy today. Lastly, we lift up the nation of New Zealand, we pray for the roughly 5.2 million people who call this nation home. While Christianity makes up roughly 32% of the population, there was a growing number of those who claim no religion or agnostics, that they have been disappointed by the church through a number of recent scandals that have taken place in various churches across the nation. Father, I pray that people may find comfort and that you are worthy of their devotion and that you will never fail us. People fail us, churches will fail us, but you are an unmovable foundation that can, we can stake our lives and our salvation in. I pray for faithful shepherds to be raised up and for true biblical churches to spread across the nation of New Zealand for your glory. And now I lift up my fellow elder to you, Hobson, 
as he brings the word to us. May you give him clarity in mind. May you open our hearts and our ears to what your word says. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, family. As we prepare to dive into the message of the cross in the Gospel of Matthew, I think this is a dangerous portion of Scripture. And I say that because I think there's a temptation to approach this part of Scripture, maybe like some of the Greek-speaking world dealt with the Apostle Paul. There was many people in the cities that Paul visited that wanted always to hear something new wanting to hear something new and interesting and insightful. And when we come upon this passage of Scripture in the next few weeks as we look at the cross and what Jesus did for us, we are not coming upon something new, but something very old. It's dangerous because this very old story about something that happened a very long time ago can begin to become for us Sterile, boring, and familiar. And we begin to lose sight of really the purpose of preaching, the purpose of God's Word. It's it's not first and foremost just to give us information, some series of facts about what happened. It is meant to transform us so that our hearts might long to know and love and worship Jesus more fully. So my prayer for us this morning is that as we dive into really what's some holy ground in God's Word this Sunday and next Sunday and the week after, that we would not approach this text with a sense of boredom, with a sense of show me something new, something that I haven't seen yet. May we instead come to this text and say, God, would you help me to see more clearly what I already know if you're a follower of Jesus? May you help me to see this and and to be overwhelmed by what I'm seeing here. If your Bibles aren't already open to Matthew 27, verse 11, I'm going to ask you to turn there. It's going to help you to follow along in the gospel of Matthew with a Bible on your lap where you can look at the verses as we go through them together. We are nearing the end of a however many long year journey in Matthew's gospel. I hope that you've learned a lot in our time together over the past few years studying this great book of Scripture As we prepare to watch Jesus as he heads closer and closer to the cross, I want you to think for just a moment about how you would describe a friend maybe or a family member to somebody else. You're you're trying to describe somebody to somebody else. How would you describe them? Perhaps you would describe them by talking about what they do. Uh, They're they're the, the pastor or the manager at such and such a place, or they own their business doing this or that. You might describe them by how they look. They're tall or short, a man or a woman, big or small, bald or not. You might describe them by some personality trait. They're outgoing or they're introverted. Uh, They always seem to be happy or they always seem to be a little bit Eeyore-ish, a little bit glum. You might describe them by some of their hobbies. You know, he's a fisherman, or, or he's a hunter, or she's a seamstress, or she really loves to cook. Or you, there's all these sorts of things that we might use to describe a person. But here's something that we almost never use in describing another person. We almost never describe them by their suffering. Suffering, in our minds is usually thought of as an obstacle to be avoided, some sort of difficulty to overcome. We rarely view suffering as the thing which defines us, as the thing which spotlights who we are. And yet when we come to the suffering of Jesus, this is where we see who He is. If you want to know who Jesus 
is. If you want to know who he is at his core, if you want to know who he is at his heart, if you want to see Jesus, the best place to look is not the side of a mountain as he's teaching his disciples. It's not there as he feeds thousands of people with a a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish. It's not on the Sea of Galilee as he's calming a storm or walking on water. It's not where he's outside of Lazarus' tomb and saying, Lazarus, come forth. If you want to see Jesus most clearly, you look to his suffering. That's where you see who Jesus is. The big idea that I hope to communicate from God's word this morning is that Jesus' suffering doesn't hide his identity. It highlights it. We see who Jesus is as we look to his suffering. With God's help, I want to show you three glorious truths about Jesus that are highlighted as his suffering begins in our text this morning. Number one, I want you to notice that Jesus is the suffering servant. We know because we've been watching the conflict with Jesus and the religious leaders really unfold throughout the Gospel of Matthew. We know that they want to kill him. We also know that they want the Romans to kill Jesus. They need the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, to execute Jesus. If you know anything about the authority that the religious leaders have in that day, you know that they technically didn't have authority to deliver the death sentence to somebody. And so they're looking for Roman authority to issue a death sentence to Jesus. But what's interesting to me is that the religious leaders really didn't care about that when it came to Stephen in Acts chapter 7. They didn't have authority to kill him, and yet they did. They didn't have authority to kill Paul the apostle, and yet they, they tried for years to put Paul to death. Why is it here in this text that they are not willing to just kill Jesus themselves? Because they don't want to take the blame. They want to keep their popularity with the people, and they want the fall guy to be Rome, whom the Jews already hate. But in order to convince Rome, in order to convince Pontius Pilate to kill Jesus, they have to have an offense that Pilate would care about. And so, they come up with a list of trumped up charges. Luke's gospel, Luke 23, verses 1 and 2, tells us what these are. They say that we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Three charges. He's misleading our nation. He's forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. And he's saying that he's the Messiah Christ, the king. The first two charges are absolutely false. Jesus never misled anybody. Jesus never told anybody not to pay their taxes. In fact, just a few days earlier, Jesus said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar and to God's that which is God's. And we saw a few days before that where Jesus paid his taxes, even pulling money out of a fish's mouth to pay his taxes. Two, first two accusations had no merit whatsoever. Only the third was actually true. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was a king. And that's the accusation that Pilate is interested in in Matthew 27. All of a sudden, that piques Pilate's interest. If Jesus is a king, perhaps he's committing treason, sedition against the empire. And so look at verse 11. Pontius Pilate is interviewing Jesus. The text says, now Jesus stood before the governor And the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priest and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. I want you to picture the scene. Jesus is before Pontius Pilate. 
And charge after charge, accusation after accusation is levied against Jesus. And Jesus stands there and says nothing. Do you know how hard it is to be falsely accused and keep your mouth shut and not reply? Shoot, if we're honest, even when we're rightly accused, we still want to defend ourselves. Well, you don't know what led me to do that. But here Jesus is, accusation one after another, not defending himself. And Pilate has never seen anything like this before. Pilate is amazed. When people are brought before him, they defend themselves. That's what people do. But now here stands a man being accused with one accusation after another, and he says nothing. The question we ought to ask is why? I think the answer is found from a prophecy made about 700 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that this coming Messiah, although he would be a king, would also be a suffering servant. Listen to Isaiah 52, verse 13. We'll read all the way to 53, verse 7. See, my servant will be successful He will be raised up and lifted up and greatly exalted. This is a great start. God says, my servant, the Messiah, is going to be lifted up. He's going to be exalted. How is he going to be lifted up? Verse 14, just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form did not resemble a human being. So he will sprinkle many nations. By the end of our text, in a couple of weeks, Jesus' body is going to be so beaten to a bloody pulp that he doesn't even look like a man. And the prophet Isaiah says he is doing this so that he will sprinkle many nations, so that people from every tribe and nation and tongue might come to faith in Jesus through the death of this suffering servant. Verse 15 continues, kings will shut their mouths because of him, for they will see what had not been told them, and they will understand what they had not heard. 53 verse 1, who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Pilate is functioning much like a king, and he stands speechless in the presence of Jesus. Who is this Jesus? This is someone unlike anyone I have ever seen before. Even though Jesus is impressive to Pilate on trial here in our text in Matthew 27. In many ways, Jesus was absolutely unimpressive. Listen to Isaiah 53, verse 2. He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. Jesus looked like an ordinary Middle Eastern dude. He didn't have a halo on his head. His skin didn't shine. All the old artwork that depicts Jesus where you just know, obviously that one's Jesus. That was not true of the literal in the flesh Jesus. He looked like a normal guy. He looked relatively unimpressive. And as a result of that, he was rejected by many. It's in Isaiah 53 verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Listen to this, brother, sister, friend. Nobody who ever lived deserved more affection than Jesus, and yet nobody who ever lived received more rejection than Jesus. He deserved all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. And what he received was vile hatred, barbarism. Why? Because Jesus is the suffering servant that came to die. Listen to Isaiah 53 verse 4. Yet he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced 
because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on Him, and we are healed by His wounds. We all, all of us went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished Him for the iniquity of us all. Jesus is marching to the cross to die as the suffering servant. No wonder He's not defending Himself. No wonder He doesn't speak on his own behalf before Pilate. In Isaiah 53, verse 7, the text says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before her shears, he did not open his mouth. Jesus stands before Pilate with his mouth closed, to fulfill the prophecy of the suffering servant given some 700 years earlier. Now, brothers and sisters in this room today, I wonder, I wonder if you sometimes get frustrated by how little Jesus is regarded in our world today. I, I wonder if you get frustrated by how many people reject Jesus and the gospel. I want you to hear me. You should not be surprised when the world rejects Jesus. Our faith, Christianity, is built on the foundation of a rejected Messiah. When Christianity seems popular, Perhaps it's because something about the truthfulness of Christianity has been obscured because this has always been unpopular. This is a religion that, that invites people to believe that they are absolutely, devastatingly depraved. This is a, a truth that invites people to believe there is only one way to God, and His name is Jesus. This is not popular. Attempts to popularize Christianity are doomed to failure because it's built on the foundation of a cornerstone that was rejected by men. So don't be caught off guard when people reject Jesus. When you tell your friends and neighbors the good news of the gospel, don't be surprised when they don't want anything to do with them. Don't be surprised when often people's response is not outright rejection, but cold indifference. That's normal. Unbelievers in this room, let me challenge you. It's possible to be like Pilate, to be amazed by Jesus, but not to trust Him. If this building all of a sudden caught on fire and our wonderful safety team began pointing everybody to one of these exit doors. It would do you no good to look at the exit door and say, wow, that's amazing. There's a way of escape. Do you guys see? There's an exit door over there. That's incredible. What do you got to do? You got to walk through the door. So too with Jesus, you can be infatuated by Jesus and amazed at Jesus and think this Jesus is incredible. Can you believe it? Pilate is kind of feeling those things and yet he does not take the way of escape. He doesn't look to Jesus and run to Jesus and run through the door of salvation that is Jesus. We would invite you, friend, it's not enough to be amazed by Jesus or interested in Jesus. You have to trust Jesus. You have to give him your life. You have to follow him. We invite you to turn from your sins and trust in Jesus today. And as he suffers before Pilate, listening quietly to one false accusation after another, we see that he is the suffering servant that the scriptures foretold. The second truth that we see about Jesus through his suffering is that he is the sinless substitute. Jesus is the sinless substitute. So here's what's happening in Pilate's mind in the text. Pilate listens to Jesus. He listens to the accusers. And as he watches what's unfolding, Pilate becomes increasingly convinced that Jesus is innocent. And so Pilate must find a way to release Jesus without angering the religious leaders. Perhaps, perhaps, Pilate's thinking, I can find a way for the people to make the decision for me. 
Look at what the text says, Matthew 27, beginning in verse 15. Now at the feast, this referring to the Passover feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Let's pause for just a moment. Pilate's got this grand plan. There's this guy, Barabbas, this prisoner. He's a bad guy. And there's Jesus, the miracle worker. Jesus, the one that the crowds screamed Hosanna to when he entered the city of Jerusalem on Sunday, just a few days earlier. What if I say to the crowd, who do you want, Barabbas or Jesus? They're going to cry out for Jesus. Absolutely. Of course they will. He had probably heard the echoes of the cries, Hosanna, just a few days earlier. He knew how much the people loved Jesus. And yet something happens. The text says he knew that it was out of envy that the Pharisees had delivered him up to Jesus or to Pilate. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. And moving on to verse 20, as Pilate is interrupted by the dream from his wife, the religious leaders mingle with the crowd and persuade the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. Pilate's got this grand plan. I'll put up Barabbas and Jesus. The people will certainly choose Jesus to be set free. And I can beat him and satisfy the religious leaders and then free him and satisfy the people. And yet God gives a dream to his wife. Perhaps it's from God. We don't know for sure. A dream comes to his wife. And in that very moment, the religious leaders are able to convince the crowd to crucify Jesus. Pilate thinks he's got a perfect plan, but Pilate is not in control. God is. A few weeks later, after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus' followers prayed this prayer in Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. Truly in this city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Whatever Pilate and the Jews were doing, it was exactly what God had planned. God had a plan to, to rescue His people, to send Jesus as the sinless substitute so even though Pilate and, and the Roman soldiers and the religious leaders are making free choices to kill and crucify Jesus, God is sovereignly working out all things according to his perfect plan. And you might be thinking, well, which is it? Is God sovereignly working everything out according to his plan? Or are these people making free choices? You know what the answer is? Yes. They're both true. They're both true. Maybe you think, well, how can they both be true? How can God sovereignly work through sinful human choices without becoming sinful himself? In his book, Providence, John Piper gives this really helpful illustration. He says that the Bible teaches clearly and repeatedly that God governs sinful human choices then he can do it without becoming unholy or unjust or impure or evil. If finite humans can find ways to handle radioact radioactive uranium to produce useful energy without being contaminated by the deadly radiation, it is likely that the infinitely wise God can handle the deadly evil of sin without contamination or harm and bringing about his wise and holy purposes. If finite humans searching for a preventative vaccine can handle the lethal virus of new diseases without being infected themselves, it's likely that the infinitely wise and good God can handle the disease of sin without being infected. 
Or as Rosaria Butterfield says in her latest book, God uses sin sinlessly. What an amazingly powerful God. Pilate is making free, sinful choices. And he is doing exactly what God intends him to do. The religious leaders are acting out of envy and jealousy, making free, sinful choices. And yet, according to Acts chapter 4, they're doing whatever God had predestined to take place. This bloodthirsty mob is absolutely diabolical in their evil to cry out, crucify him, and they are doing exactly what God has determined that they would do. God is determined to provide a substitute so that his people can be saved. And nothing will stop him from accomplishing his purposes. I hope, dear brother, sister, friend, that that's a great comfort to you if you're in Christ. That nothing that this world can throw at you can override the purposes of a good God. God's going to provide a substitute. And we see a picture of that substitution in what happens with Jesus and Barabbas. Look at verse 20. Now the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. And the governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. I want us to think for just a moment about the contrast between Barabbas and Jesus. Barabbas was guilty. Verse 16 says he was a notorious prisoner. But Matthew doesn't tell us why he was in prison. Luke does in Luke 23. He says that Barabbas was a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. So Barabbas is not a petty offender in rehab. He's a murderer on death row. Barabbas is guilty, but Jesus was innocent. When Pilate's wife came to plead for Jesus' life, she called Jesus a righteous man. Pilate knew that his wife was right. He watched Jesus. He listened to the accusations, and he watched Jesus and how he handled himself. And no wonder in verse 23, he says, what evil has he done? And the answer to Pilate's question is, of course, none. Jesus did no evil, and yet the innocent is going to die, and the guilty is going to live. Barabbas deserved to die. Whatever your opinions on the death penalty today, the Bible seems to indicate that one way we value human life is by executing those who unjustly take human life. Listen to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, what God says to Noah after the flood. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. There was no question of Barabbas' guilt. Everybody knew that Barabbas was guilty. Everybody knew that Barabbas deserved to die. But Jesus... Jesus didn't deserve to die. Jesus deserved to be celebrated. Jesus is the author of life. In John's gospel, we learn this about Jesus. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus created every voice box screaming, crucify Him. Jesus created the hands that will in just a moment wash themselves to cleanse Himself of any responsibility. Jesus created the wood on which he was crucified. Jesus created the iron from which the nails were forged. Jesus created the strips of leather that came from the beast that was slaughtered to make the cat of nine tails from which he was scourged. Jesus is the creator. He's the giver of life, and yet he is about to die. Barabbas is released and given a new life. While Jesus is condemned and given over to death. 
The innocent is condemned so that the guilty can go free. The sinless dies so that the sinner can live. Do you remember the story of David and Bathsheba? He sinned by sleeping with a woman that wasn't his wife and then killed her husband to cover up his sin. And Nathan the prophet comes to King David to confront him in his sin. And Nathan tells David a story. He says, there was once a rich man with a lot of sheep. And his neighbor had one sheep. It was maybe something like a household pet. And the rich man one day had a visitor come to stay with him and he wanted to prepare him some nice MLTs, you know, mutton, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches. That part's not in there, but he wanted to prepare some mutton, but he didn't want to kill any of his sheep. So he went to his neighbor's house, and he stole his one sheep, slaughtered that sheep, and served that to his friend. The Bible tells us when Nathan the prophet told King David that story, that David became furious. And he said, that rich man deserves to die. You remember what Nathan the prophet said to David? You are the man. I think Matthew is doing something similar with his account of Jesus and Barabbas. If you pay attention to the story, there's something in you that should become angry and indignant at the injustice of it all. How can Barabbas go free? How can, he, how can he be set free and Jesus be condemned? And Matthew looks at us in the eyes and he says, you are Barabbas. Do you see it? Do you see, like Barabbas, we are guilty. Romans 3, 23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Like Barabbas, we deserve death. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And like Barabbas, we can be released and given new life. On the cross, Jesus is about to accomplish what is illustrated in this exchange for Jesus and Barabbas. The innocent is going to be condemned so that the guilty, you and I, can go free. The sinless is going to die so that the sinner can live. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The main difference between you and me and Barabbas is only in how we must respond. All Barabbas had to do was walk out of that jail cell. For you and I to respond to the sinless substitute, we must repent and believe. We must turn from our sins, turn from our personal efforts to earn salvation on our own and trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone. In repentance, you admit that you're a sinner who deserves to die. You admit that what God says about your sin is true, and you commit to forsaking it with God's help, you turn away from your sin. And in faith, you trust that Jesus really is the sinless substitute, that he really was innocent, that he really did die a sinner's death, and he really did rise from the dead. We would invite you, dear friend, if you're here and you've never repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, would you do that here before you leave today? You can do that in your heart right where you are, right in your seat, just crying out to Jesus and saying, I do believe. I want to turn from my sins. I want to trust in you. I believe that, that I'm like Barabbas and you died so that I could live. If you do that in your heart where you are today, would you talk to one of us before you leave? If you're one of our pastors, one of our elders, would you hold your hand up for just a second? Hold your hand up, elders. We're all over here this morning. That's great. Um, which means if you're over here, you have to go over there to talk to them unless they come over this way. We're not the only ones that can talk to you about this, but we would love to talk to you about this. If you're in this room and you've never truly turned from your sins and put your faith in Jesus, we want to help you 
to do that. You can talk to any of us or anyone else that brought you here, invited you here, or that you're sitting around about what it means to truly follow Jesus so we can help you in that walk. But there is nothing more important that you could do today than to give your life to this Jesus so that you can be set free, just like Barabbas was. But I do want to give you a warning this morning. If you will not do this today, hear this. You will either receive Jesus as your substitute or reject Jesus for a substitute. There's really only two choices. You will either receive him as the substitute that died in your place or you will reject him for something or someone else. That's what all of us do. One of those two things. The religious leaders rejected Jesus for the cheap substitute of religious power. Pilate rejects Jesus for the cheap substitute of good poll numbers. And the crowd rejects Jesus for the cheap substitute of fitting in with everybody else. Let me ask you, dear friend, what cheap substitute have you chosen in place of Jesus? And on Judgment Day, will that substitute be worth it? The suffering of Jesus reveals that he is the sinless substitute who died in our place. And finally, we see in that Jesus' suffering that he is the sacrificial lamb. Pilate thought that he could get the crowd, he could manipulate the crowd to release Jesus, but it became obvious that a riot starting to form, the crowd is bloodthirsty, they've been convinced by the religious leaders, they're crying out for Jesus to be crucified. It's obvious to Pilate that the only path forward, if he wants to keep his favorability with the crowd, if he wants to keep his position as a governor from Rome, he's going to have to crucify Jesus. But Pilate is probably scared. He believed his wife, most likely. He sees who Jesus is. He knows that this man is not guilty. And so he comes up with a plan to declare himself innocent of whatever happens next. Look at verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. 2,000 years later, we still say, I, I wash my hands of this, pointing back to what Pilate did right here in this account. It's an attempt to say, I'm not really guilty. You're responsible, not me. And yet, Pilate was responsible, wasn't he? It was Pilate who gave the word for Jesus to be crucified. It was Pilate's soldiers that scourged Jesus. Pilate's soldiers that nailed the nails into his hands and feet and drove the spear into his side. Later on in Matthew's gospel, we'll learn that it was Pilate's, Pilate who determines what will be done with Jesus' body. And Pilate is the one that sends the guards outside of Jesus' tomb. And it's no surprise that the, the Apostles' Creed, which summarizes what Christians believe and has been a summary of Christian doctrine for 1,700 years, says that Jesus suffered under who? Pontius Pilate. Hear me, brother, sister, friend. Simply claiming that you are innocent does not make it so. You can wash your hands of Jesus, but you will still one day be judged by him. You can eagerly and earnestly profess your innocence, I'm not really that bad, and still be guilty. Listen to what John Stott says about Pilate. He says, it's easy to condemn Pilate and overlook our own equally devious behavior. Anxious to avoid the pain of a wholehearted commitment to Christ, we either leave the decision to somebody else or opt for a half-hearted compromise, or seek to honor Jesus for the wrong reason, or even make a public affirmation of loyalty, while at the same time denying Him in our hearts. Brothers and sisters and friends, how are you and I like Pilate? And what areas of your life are you willing to commit halfway to Jesus? As guilty as 
Pilate appears in our text, the crowd looks even more so. Look with me at verse 25. After Pilate washes his hands, he says, I'm not guilty of this man's blood. The people answered, his blood be on us and our children. That is an absolutely staggering statement. Here's what they're saying, essentially. You don't want to you don't want to be blamed for it, Pilate? That's fine. Blame me. Blame my kids. You don't have to take the blame for it. We'll take the blame. His blood can be on me and my kids. We'll bear the blame. Some people have wrongly said that the troubles of the Jewish people throughout the centuries and even today are God's judgment upon them for what they said here. But let me just remind you that God does not punish children for the sins of their parents. Listen to Ezekiel 18 verse 20. It says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. God does punish the city of Jerusalem in AD 70 when the temple is destroyed and the city is in flames, but he does not punish the children for the sins of their fathers. Isn't that good news, parents? Aren't you so grateful that God doesn't punish your kids for your sin? And aren't you so grateful that God doesn't punish you for your parents' sins? Now, perhaps you're hearing all this and you're wondering, what does any of this have to do with Jesus being the sacrificial lamb? I want you to go back again to what the people said in verse 25. They said, his blood, Jesus' blood, be on us and on our children. What the people meant was, blame us, blame our kids for Jesus' death. But God is going to take their words and use them for something even better than they could have ever imagined. And in those words, God is showing us once again something about Jesus. Jesus is going to die like one of the sacrificial lambs that was slaughtered in the Old Testament so that God's people could be forgiven. If you read through the Old Testament, you read through the ceremonies, often a lamb's blood would be shed and then the blood would be sprinkled upon something. Sometimes it was sprinkled and spread upon the doorposts, the Passover. Sometimes like on the Day of Atonement, it would be sprinkled upon the Ark of the Covenant. Sometimes it would be sprinkled upon the people themselves. As a vivid reminder, as warm blood is sprinkled upon your face, that only by the blood can your sins be covered. And now here in our text, Jesus is going, his blood is going to cover some of these people. For some of the people in the mob, the blood of Jesus would fall upon them, not to condemn them, but to cleanse them, not to damn them, but to save them. And so too, God's blood, the blood of Christ, has come upon every single one of you who believe. You would have been in the crowd crying out, crucify him. I would have been too. I would have been right there with them, saying, may his blood fall on my head. And God, in his incredible mercy, looks at some of those people in the crowd, and he says, all right, it will, but not to damn you, to rescue you. Do you see the love of your father, that he would allow his son to die the death of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John the Baptist said, to cleanse us from our iniquities. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Or Charles Wesley who wrote, his blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Now, before we conclude, I want to say one brief word to the Christians in this room about the beauty and the glory of this cross. I think sometimes, I think sometimes we're tempted to think that the cross of Christ 
is kind of like the jumper cables for your car. When your car's batteries die, you need jumper cables to get it started, and then you move on. You don't think about them. You know, most of you don't get into your car, buckle your seatbelt, and make sure you've got your jumper cables in your hand, right? You don't really think about it until you need them, right? It's what you need to get the car started. It's not what you need to keep, keep it going. And some of us think that the cross is like that. The cross is what you need to become a Christian, but once you become a Christian, you can just kind of move on to other things. Let's, let's talk about marriage and parenting and finances and all these other things. Let's talk about missions and discipleship and all those things are wonderful. We should talk about them. And yet, the cross of Christ is not like the jumper cables to get your car started. It's like the engine. You can't get anywhere in the Christian life except through the cross of Christ. You want to be a better mom or a better dad? Go to the cross. You want, you want to do better with your finances? Look to the cross. Look at what Christ gave to you for you, and then you give. You want to grow in holiness? You look to the cross, and you're reminded, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. It is well with my soul. You want to be a better wife, a better husband, a better son, a better daughter? You go to the cross of Christ. Why do we talk so much about the cross and sing so much about the cross? Because this is the heart of Christianity. This is where it is that Jesus would be our sacrificial lamb, our sinless substitute, and our suffering servant. Would you look to him, Christian? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true. We thank you for the testimony of the Apostle Paul, who said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We know that Paul knew all sorts of things and talked about all sorts of things, but all those things were looked at through the lens of the cross. God, we pray, would you help us to look at marriage and parenting and singleness and dating and money and work? and depression, and anxiety, and pride, and every other area of our lives, may we look at it through the lens of the cross. God, this is hard, because if we're honest, we're tempted to look at it through the lens of, of TikTok, or YouTube, or whatever our favorite news station is, or whatever our feelings are, or whatever our best friend said, God, we need to look at it through the lens of the cross. So as we spend some time over the next few weeks as a church looking at the cross, help us also to learn how to look at every area of life with cross-shaped eyes. We pray that you would do these things and more for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing together? was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you had not loved me first, Jesus is
on this benediction the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you amen